Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm Nick Marks and yeah, I'm going to be talking about happiness, but particularly about creativity and about how creativity is intelligence having fun. And that is a quote from the great Albert Einstein, one of the most intelligent humans to ever walk the planet. And we think of him about intelligence and creativity and, and perhaps fun too. But I want to make the case today that intelligent positivity is the way to create an innovative culture of creativity at the US Air Force. So just a little bit about me. I am a data guy. I'm a statistician. That's my trade. But I'm also a people person. I trained not only as a statistician, but as a psychotherapist. My mother was a therapist. And perhaps it becomes inevitable that I become the guy that does <clears throat> data about happiness, quality of life, well-being. I used to advise the Tony Blair government and the David Cameron government in the UK. And I did a TED talk about 10 years ago about that work. But over the last 10 years, I've been thinking about it in organizations, how to make them more successful, creative, innovative, by looking at how positive they can be. So. What I'm going to talk about is about what emotions and positive emotions are for, how feelings are really good, bad signals, and how you can capture that statistically, and how when you know data like that, you can show that positivity leads to success and creativity, and that ways to build positivity at work, and finally, just some little musings, really, on structure of organizations and innovation. So to it, what, what are feelings for? You know, humans are obviously sentient beings. We're not just cognition machines, we have emotions. And the work that I particularly like is by a neuroscientist called Antonio Damasio. He wrote a book a couple of years ago now called The Strange Order of Things, which is kind of a strange title. But what he was really saying is that emotion comes before cognition, not only in the moment, but also in our evolutionary history. And that they really serve three main functions for the organism, which is that they help us monitor our environment they help us motivate to give us the energy to act. And they help us adjust those behaviors once we're in the flow of them. Now, if we think about monitoring, really at its heart, this is a stimulus response mechanism. It's really saying, is, are we a good fit for our environment? It's a sort of good, bad signal. Are we unhappy where we are? Are we happy? You know, if we're a happy frog, we stay in the pond that we are. If we're an unhappy happy frog, we bounce off and uh, go and find another pond. This happens to us you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. Like if you're at a party, um, if you can remember those before lockdown, but we did used to go to parties and you meet new people and immediately you have a sort of like dislike signal. You know, Are they a friend or a foe is our evolutionary signal. And how do, um, and how do we uh, act upon that? So uh, as a statistician, what's interesting about that is such a pure signal that you can actually put a number on it and you can start saying, are you very unhappy, very happy? And you can give people scores on that. This is a question I work a lot with in my work. How have you felt at work this week? And you can capture that data. I'm just gonna flash you a graph here of actually, this is the experience of COVID hitting for all our clients across all of our client base. You can see up until uh, the end of last year, they're trundling along. There's always a peak at the Christmas period, holiday periods, people feel happier, there's parties going on. Um, you know, they're coming up towards a holiday, but then they go back to their mean, which has normally been around 70, 69.6 um, is the exact figure. COVID hits, and this is across all of our clients, it hit everybody pretty much the same time. Everybody took a hit. And then there's that slow bounce back. And really that is resilience in action. We're seeing that across our clients, people, humans want to be resilient, they are resilient, and they're climbing back. They're not quite to where they were because work is still very variable and, and more difficult as we're experiencing today. We're not together. But they not only monitor our environment, we can only create data on that, but they also motivate us. And psychologists tend to think in terms of positive and negative emotions, or even before that, universal or primary emotions. There's a guy called Paul Ekman, did a lot of work in the 60s, 70s, 80s, he's still, he's still active today, talking about what emotions all human beings fear, feel. Anger, fear, sadness, happiness. These are all emotions that we all feel across all cultures. And in some ways, anger and fear are part of the fight and flight mechanism. When we're angry, we're trying to uh, deter a violation of a norm. Frightened, someone's uh, something's threatening our well-being, we need to take evasive action, run away, freeze, gather together. They're very, very functional. They may be negative, they may be slightly uncomfortable, but they're functional. And in one way, that they're trying to function us to avoid things. Whereas happiness is an approach uh, emotion. It's saying go towards. 
But it's actually much richer than that. And it's one of the reasons is we tend to use happiness as like a gateway word to many different emotions. Uh, if I ask people, you know, what does happiness mean to you? Then some people will say contentment. Others will say joy or enthusiasm. Well, they're very different emotions. You know, contentment is quiet, reflective. Joy, enthusiasm are active, uh, uh, full of energy. And there are lots of positive emotions in between. And they all, in a way, serve different functions. So, as I said, contentment is about reflecting. Something's gone well. What, what, you know, what, what can we learn from that? How can we repeat it? Joy or awe is about reaching. It's about uh, mobilizing energy. Or awe is about reaching for a higher goal. You know, we, we, we perhaps in nature and we experience something, or perhaps we're hearing a very inspiring speaker, and we 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 want to uh, raise our goals to it. But then emotions like curiosity, explore the world, interest, focus, our attention, you know, going very deeply into something, gratitude, amusement, enjoyment, they're about bonding, creating relationships. And if you're building a positive team, then actually you want people to move between all of these emotions. These are all highly functional and they're absolutely what makes us human. And what I want to say is they also what make us successful humans, what makes us creative and innovative teams in organizations is that sense of positivity going around. So I, I can show lots of data on happiness and success, but today I'm just going to really concentrate on the creativity. But I have got data on how happier people stay longer at work, they're more productive, happier organizations have higher share performance. But today, just creativity I'm going to do. And I'm going to use a classic experiment to illustrate it. It's called the Dunker Candle Experiment. Uh, it was created, I think, in the 1940s, and it's a lateral thinking uh, challenge. You've got some matches, a box of tacks, and a candle. And how do you attach it? Uh, how do you uh, attach the candle to the wall in such a way that when you light it, the wax doesn't drip on the floor? That's a bit of a mind mess. You know, when you know the answer, it's very obvious. And the answer is, as you've got to notice, there's a box of tacks, and you empty the tax, you attach the box to the wall and you put the candle in it and you light it and there you go. Now, some people solve this, some don't. But what these psychologists did was they manipulated people's mood. So they put some people into a good mood before uh, they did the experiment. Uh, they maybe showed them a video of cats playing or baby gurgling and they put some people in a bad mood. Maybe cats being dissected or something horrible or babies screaming. Uh, and they left some people just as they came. And what they found was that the people in the control group, the neutral group, solved the Dunker Candle experiment 13% of the time in five minutes. The ones they put into a negative mood, 20% of the time. Interesting. The negative mood actually increased people's performance. Let's think about that for a second. But here's the good news. Put them into a positive mood and they solved it 75% of the time. And that's in the moment. But we also find the same thing that teams that are positive, they're more creative over the next three months is going on. So the 20% one, going back to that, it's really just to say that in some ways, fear can drive results, but not nearly as strong as supportive, positive uh, environments that are psychologically safe, as Amy Edmondson might call it. Now, that's all very well, but how do we actually create happiness at work? How do we do it? What are the ways of doing it? As I said, I'm a, I'm a researcher and a statistician as well as a CEO of a business. And done lots and lots of work, like what are the main drivers of positivity at work? And these are the five things we find in all of our data sets, which the first one is connect, which is relationships are really important. Do you belong? Do you collaborate? Have you got friendships? The second one is being treated fairly. When you're treated unfairly, it's you get angry and you, and you don't even get into the space of being positive. So respect, appreciation, work-life balance, fair pay, those sort of things. The third one is to be empowered. Are people using their strengths? Are they able to influence? Are they able to control their work? Are they able to be themselves at work? Very, very important things for people's positive experience. The fourth is to challenge them. Is that it's, it's a nonsense to think that people want to do nothing at work. They actually, people love challenge, they love stretch, love learning new things. Very, very important. And the fifth is to inspire them, which is that when people feel their work is meaningful, purposeful, they're part of something bigger, they're gonna much more enjoy those work. And these are interactive, these are a system. You don't do one at a time, you do all of them at the same time sometimes, but they, together, they're what creates a positive, productive, high-performing team. Now, I just want to just have a little musing on organizational structure and innovation. Obviously, you know, the Air Force is what we typically call a hierarchy, and it's also a very large organization. And this is my data on size of organization 
and happiness. It comes from 22,000 people around the world. So it's a pretty robust bit of data. And it's showing that on average, larger organizations are less happy than smaller ones. And how do you get around that? And uh, so when I see something says Google is the happiest place to work, I always know it's wrong. It's going to be some small company, less than 50 people that are totally passionate about what they're doing. That will be the happiest place to work. We see all the five ways because we measure all of them. They all drop over uh, off over that time. But you'll see that empower is the one that drops the most. And in some way, we feel disempowered in large systems. And I think this is something to do with innovation, too. So when you have a hierarchy, then systems thinkers will talk about how it suppresses what they call variety. Variety is different ways the system could be set. It obviously limits them so it can have a command and control. You know, very reasonable in all sorts of circumstances. But for innovation and creativity, any idea is going to have to go up and down the hierarchy. It's going to be quite inefficient. So I think we need to think about new structures and new systems. And I love the work of Buckminster Fuller. He was an extraordinary engineer and thinker. And he was very, very obsessed with these ideas of geodetic geodesic domes, this is an icosahedron, and about how they spread, how they uh, balance two fundamental tensions in engineering. Well, the idea of the powers, the forces in engineering, which is tension, which is the force that pulls things apart, and, um, and, and uh, a compression, which is what brings it together. So, um, sorry, my PowerPoint's just gone slightly wrong. Uh, there we go. Um, tension pulls things apart and compression uh, uh, compacts them together. And there's another thinker I like called Stafford Beer, who was a systems thinker about organizations. And he talked about how people are the same, that we all want to be different. We want to be independent. We want to have our own empowerment, but we also want to belong. And there was a fundamental tension away between those two forces. The icosahedron and a, and a three-dimensional structure starts to put those, uh, that create those forces and um, balance them out. So if we're doing innovation in organizations, we need to think about networks. We need to think about people being in multiple teams so that information can flow between teams rather than keeping people in silos. So have people half in one team, half in another, but the other team they're in don't have the same people as the first team. Mix them up so that ideas flow and can flow around and then they get built upon. And obviously innovation at work is very much about how people work together. So just to wrap up, uh, Positive emotions are highly functional, as are the negative emotions. Uh, they're just more uncomfortable. Positivity leads to creativity and innovation. I remember there were five ways to positivity work and that small is beautiful. And one of the challenges about creating an innovative culture is to create smallness in the bigness. Thank you very much. Uh, these are my contact details. I'm very active on LinkedIn. If you wanna find me, uh, Nick Marks without K, Friday Pulse. Thank you.